This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of September 6th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. Also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, the administration restarts discussions about revenue, but immediately rules out the approach that has the lowest adverse impact on Alaska families in the Alaska economy. Second, as the FY22 budget mess moves to the Senate, we explore how they may put Humpty Dumpty back together again. And third, we discuss some anticipated, but nonetheless good news on Conoco's Willow Project. And now, let's join Michael. We start with um, what you're calling fiscal notes and more. This is the, uh, you know, this is a this is a, a take on uh, where we're going. The administration discussing revenues, but again, adding some red lines to that. Uh, tell us where you're at with this number one of the weekly top three. Well, there was a very little noted, um, loaded noted, little noted in the uh, in the uh, mainstream press uh, uh, committee meeting last Friday. Uh, Ways and Means, the House Ways and Means Committee, um, and two things happened. One of one of which is did did get some notation along the way, but the second of which didn't. But I think is much more important. The first which uh, the first of which was Garen Tarr presented uh, her sales tax uh, proposal uh, in front of Ways and Means. Uh, it's notable because uh, it's the it, it is the f- one of the few Demo- one of the few um, uh, revenue bills that have been heard um, in the House, and it's notable because uh, Garen Tarr, who is uh, who clearly is someone who is concerned about her district is 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 a low income area, concerned about low income area, uh, is proposing a, a sales tax. Uh, frankly, because she thinks that's the only thing that can get through the uh, uh, the legislature. But the second part of the hearing was was to me the much more important one, and it was the administration again uh, presenting on revenue options. We had uh, er, uh, a few weeks ago uh, we had uh, Revenue Commissioner Lucinda Mahoney uh, present in front of the working group uh, a, a discussion of various revenue options, and I and others at the time thought that was a great step because the administration was finally talking about. Uh, replacement revenues to uh, to the PFD. Right. Um, and then the governor very shortly thereafter walk, seemed to walk back from that uh, and say, no, we're not basically say, no, we're not talking about new revenues. Uh, and that sort of uh, that sort of uh, uh, killed the uh, the spirit, I think, that uh, that had been created by uh, Commissioner Mahoney's presentation on uh, on revenues. The second half of the Ways and Means uh, committee hearing uh, last Friday was uh, now Deputy Commissioner Brian Fector uh, presenting uh, on revenues uh, again on revenues, not Commissioner Mahoney this time, uh, but uh, but the Deputy Commissioner presenting on revenues, and a fairly thorough um, uh, presentation on revenues that uh, that frankly laid out a lot of revenue options uh, more than than had been laid out laid out by Commissioner Mahoney. Uh, put numbers, uh, uh, at least gross revenue numbers, uh, that the administration uh, uh, estimated would be raised uh, by uh, various revenue options, which is very useful uh, to have that uh, information. 
Um, but then uh, drew uh, three red lines uh, uh, in the sand, uh, saying uh, what the commit, what the what the administration would not do. Sort of a, a, a version of of Governor Dunleavy's backing off the uh, uh, backing off any discussion of revenues uh, the last time it came up. But this this one was at least a more limited back off. Uh, the three red lines that uh, that uh, Brian, uh, the deputy commissioner, outlined was the governor would insist on, if there were going to be revenues, would insist on a 50-50 POMV, uh, which I think is 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 fine, uh, would insist on a new constitutional spending limit tighter than the one that's already in the Constitution as a as a condition of adopting new revenues. Right. Uh, and I think that's fine. Uh, but the third one, uh, I think, is problematic. And the third one was the, gov the governor's red line was there would be no income tax. Now, the, the, the concern I have or the problem I have with no income tax is that income taxes um, come in a, a variety of ways, shapes and forms. Some are bad, but some can be uh, a fairly good. A flat tax that you and I have talked about before uh, on the show would be a low impact on the on the uh, uh, average uh, uh, Alaska family would be a low impact on the overall Alaska economy uh, and I think would be I think would be a better approach than a regressive than a regressive sales tax um, but the governor drew the line in the sand saying no income tax now yeah you know maybe he means uh, uh, no income tax at all and that's probably what he means. Maybe he means no prog a, a no progressive income tax, which, frankly, I have a problem with because it takes more from upper income Alaska families than it does from middle and lower income Alaska families and shoves the burden in the opposite direction than PFD cuts. Um, but but he but he drew that red line and that that red line, I think, got a lot of uh, uh, a lot of pushback uh, during the course of the hearing. So I, I think I think the I think the takeaway from this that that the press thus far has missed I think the takeaway is revenues are the administration has put revenues back on the table, uh, which I think is a is a very uh, positive uh, development, because if we're going to get a permanent, I mean, as even the working group recognized, if we're going to get a permanent solution to this situation. Uh, it's going to take some new revenues. Right. Um, and uh, and and but I think that the, the detraction from the presentation was the red line saying uh, no income taxes, which I think takes off the table, uh, in, at least in some forms and some variations, uh, uh, a tool that uh, that could be very useful in minimizing the impact of new revenues on Alaska families and the overall Alaska economy. Yeah, I mean, I thought one of the interesting things, what he talked about increases uh, for revenue options, including proposals for an increase uh, in taxes on the oil industry and the sales tax and the gambling uh, or gaming, you know, some kind of gaming tax. I mean, there's a there's solid options. Now, why he didn't produce these four months ago, I have no idea, but there they are. Uh, and uh, but I, I think that the no income tax is obviously, you know, he's trying to uh, he's trying to, uh, you know, I think that plays into that whole conversation of we're not going to have an income tax where then we're just going to swap it for this for the uh, PFD. I think that that kind of plays into that a little bit as well. But I guess, we'll you know, I, I don't know your thoughts. Well, I I. I I'm concerned about it. I mean, the way I would approach this and the way I think the legislature should approach it and the way I think the governor should approach it is, look, let's look for the lowest impact revenue option, lowest impact on Alaska families and on the Alaska economy. Let's set that as the goal. Let's not let's not, you know, take any revenue option off the table. Some will take themselves off the table when when we when we apply the the filter of low impact on Alaska families and and uh, and the Alaska economy, but let's let's set the goal as the lowest impact revenue option on Alaska families and uh, and and Alaska uh, and the Alaska economy. I think that should be the goal, um, and I think you know I think everything should be run, every revenue option should be run through that filter. I mean that's part of the problem with the PFD. It's never been run through that filter. Has the largest adverse impact on Alaska families in the Alaska economy, and yet that's the one that's the one we're using. I think we ought to have a policy goal that we're striving for, and then look at the various revenue options uh, through that filter. Uh, and and it's you know the the presentation 
did not come with as as the administration has never done as this administration has never done as the legislature's never done this did not come with a, a distributional analysis it didn't come with an economic impact analysis uh, so you've got gross numbers but you don't know the impact across alaska families you don't know the impact across the alaska economy um, and i think that ought to be the goal i, I we're, we're doing it backwards you know we're we're, we're saying we're going to use certain revenue options uh, just because you know they sound better uh, sales taxes sound better uh, than PFD cuts, but sales taxes are regressive in the same way that PFD cuts are. They have the same adverse impact on the same the same directional impact, adverse impact on Alaska families and the Alaska economy. I, we we ought to set out that goal. What are what's best for the Alaska economy and Alaska families, and then and then filter all the revenue options through that. Well, and again, not a lot of dis- not a lot of talks on discussions of uh, of reductions in government, which we know is you know really the only solution that hurts the people the least in this regard. But um, I guess we'll 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 see what goes on from here. Did you get a chance to read this article, Brad, on the uh, Constitutional Convention that James Brooks put out uh, yesterday? I did. Um, I mean, are you as I mean, I, I, I love the idea that we might have a silver bullet to get things done, but at the same time, I'm terrified. Um, what, what, are, what is your take on this? Well, I'm against the Constitutional Convention because I think it opens up too many things. I think the Alaska Constitution is a good document. Uh, I, I, I do think the PFD should be part of it, um, uh, but, I, but I view that as, a, as an issue that ought to be taken up as, as, a, as an amendment as opposed to as opposed to const, uh, constitutional convention, um, I, I don't. I, I I think James was James's uh, analysis that, um, or the the sources that he was discussing it with that uh, a constitutional convention could become just as divided as the legislature uh, is, a, is is a very good one. Uh, just as contentious, just as many issues as you see surfaced uh, in the House. Uh, would be surfaced in a constitutional convention, and there's no guarantee a constitutional convention would would produce anything. And there's the potential that it would produce uh, uh, some bad things uh, from from either side's perspective. Right. So I, I will say this: I mean, the 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 fear of a constitutional convention may be a may be a useful motivator in getting the legislature to deal with the PFD. Uh, on a on a you know on a constitutional amendment basis, propose and and adopt a constitutional amendment that would go to the voters in 2022, um, and the fear of some that if they don't resolve the PFD, it would increase the chances and potentially result in a constitutional convention. I think that's probably a good motivator, but but at the end of the day, would I vote for a constitutional convention? Uh, uh, even if the PFD has not been resolved, no, I wouldn't. Uh, just because of the of the concerns about uh, about uh, the number of issues that could get opened and uh, and potentially resolved in a in an unfavorable way. Right. No, I mean that's always been my concern. Uh, even a discussion on the convention of the states. I know that that's been uh, discussed in the past as well. And 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 my whole premise has been, geez, be careful what you wish for, because once that once you open Pandora's box. You can't you can't close it up again. You can't you know when you open it up for both. It's not just for your stuff. It's for everybody's stuff. And in a best case scenario, you get your stuff. Nobody gets nobody else gets their stuff. You close it back up. But that's absolute best case scenario. Worst case scenario, you don't get anything, and somebody else gets to change all the things that they want. And uh, it's I mean it, it you know you're you're worse off than when you started, which I think is the biggest danger here. Yeah, and Michael, I guess there's 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 another thing. I mean, if if we if we don't have a PFD constitutional amendment by that and, and by then, and people vote for the constitutional convention to adopt it, in part to have a PFD uh, amendment, um, so all the pressure gets taken off of having a separate PFD amendment, and so we go into this four year cycle, basically a four year cycle uh, of of trying to. Uh, you know, get the P- get, get a constitutional convention going, get the PFD inside it, and then if if either the constitutional convention fails, or it produces a product that that might include a PFD amendment, but includes a lot of other uh, things, and the 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 new constitution is rejected, 
then we've just lost like eight years uh, of of you know getting the PFD in the Constitution. I think I think there's I think it's a lot better to focus on the PFD, keep the pressure on the PFD, getting the PFD in the Constitution, getting that adopted, than it is, <coughs> excuse me, than it is suddenly to divert all that pressure uh, off on a constitutional convention. Because, you know, so we vote for a constitutional convention in 2022. Well, then we have to elect delegates. <laughs> so that's the next election. And then we have to have the constitutional convention and then we have to vote on the constitutional convention. So that's the next election. So we're out to 2026 before we have a vote on on the on the constitutional convention. And it's just um, I, I would rather keep the pressure on the PFD itself, keep the focus on the PFD than uh, than than, you know, let it get lost in the midst of other things in the middle middle of a of a big constitutional convention. Uh, Brad Keithley, our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. I mean, I, I agree. I uh, again, I my fear, and I know that Bill says convention of the states and the constitutional convention are completely different. I mean, but it's this, it's the conceptual, it's the concepts of both things. I know that they're separate things, Bill. But again, I get very worried when you start talking about opening up the constitutions of either the state or the United States for these kind of radicalized amendments. I get very worried about that because again, it's not just you who's pushing for the changes, and I think that's the that's the thing to to realize and remember when it's all said and done it's not just you pushing for the changes it's all it's every yahoo in the world that wants what they're doing let's uh let's move on to uh, number two of the weekly top three which is uh a look at where we go from here in the special session uh actually uh jeff landfield over at the alaska landmine had a pretty good piece that kind of outlines all the options and bells and whistles that are going on right now uh let's break it down yeah, the, uh, the 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 output of the House, which is an 1,100 PFD uh, with a source of funding for the PFD in question, uh, uh, payment of statutory uh, oil tax credits with the source of funds for that payment in question. The output of the House now moves over to the Senate, um, and the and the focus this coming week, uh, I think, will be uh, in Senate finance on how it deals. Uh, with those issues. Frankly, I think there will be a lot of effort in Senate finance to sort of put Humpty Dumpty back together again uh, in terms of uh, in terms of sources of, of financing and uh, and and making these uh, these pieces uh, uh, work. Uh, the problem with the PFD is that uh, half of it comes from the SBR or a portion of it comes from the SBR. The statutory budget reserve, which the administration takes the position, uh, has been swept. Uh, because there wasn't, there, we didn't have the reverse sweep uh, 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 in 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 the House uh, that takes the position that the that the SBR has been swept, and so there is nothing in the SBR as the administration's position. So when you try to fund half the PFD out of the SBR, there's nothing there to fund, which effectively cuts the PFD uh, uh, back down to the to the 600, 500, 600 dollar range uh, that it was before. Same thing on oil taxes. Uh, a portion of the oil tax credits that are statutorily due uh, ha are fu is funded from the CBR, uh, but without the CBR vote, without the two-thirds CBR vote, uh, you can't access those funds, and so the oil taxes are 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 short paid uh, or short funded at least. So the Senate gets is is going to is going to have to deal with uh, what should be the size of the PFD. Uh, what's the funding source of the PFD, uh, and what's the funding source? What's the size of, and what's the funding source uh, for oil taxes? And and in an effort to try to get that all straightened out, Jeff uh, Landfield, uh, in his column, uh, I think uh, again better than we've seen in the mainstream press, does a good job of sort of piecing through where the committee sits on that. Basically, on the PFD, it's uh, three and three. Uh, three on the on the pro PFD, three on the uh, uh, PFD cut uh, side, and then Senator Hoffman sort of sitting in the middle. Uh, the three on the pro PFD are uh, uh, Senator Wilson, uh, Senator Wilkowski, uh, and Senator Olson. Uh, the three on the anti PFD side, PFD side are obviously Senator Stedman, Senator Von Imhoff, um, and uh, 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 
uh, Senator Bishop from uh, from Fairbanks, uh, and Lyman's the Lyman's the seventh vote. So uh, Lyman's great at, uh, at at making deals, playing games, making deals, uh, and so we'll uh, we'll see uh, what the Senate Finance does on the PFD uh, and on uh, and on oil taxes. Uh, Landfield also makes one important point. One of the reasons, uh, one of the motivations for Lyman to come on board uh, with the uh, uh, with the 5050, the POMV 5050 constitutional amendment, uh, was that uh, the PCE uh, 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 power cost equalization fund uh, was in question at the time uh, about whether it was going to be uh, uh, cut off by the, or swept back uh, if there was a uh, failure of the uh, of the reverse sweep, the Superior Court uh, uh, the, the the PCE issue got taken to the Superior Court. The Superior Court found that the PCE wasn't subject to the reverse wasn't subject to the sweep. Um, the administration, for whatever reason, decided not to appeal that to the Supreme Court. So the uh, Superior Court decision stands on the PCE uh, right now, uh, and so the PCE is not subject to sweep. Uh, as a result of the Superior Court's decision. So that motivation by Lyman to want to deal with the administration uh, uh, on on uh, on POMB 5050 because of the uh, the potential risk it, to the PCE is gone. Um, and and Landfield raises uh, makes a good makes a good uh, comment, I think, about you know what Lyman's sort of motivation for how to deal with the PFD is sort of moved is sort of up in the air. So right. a lot of activity, a lot of activity coming at, Se- at Senate finance this week. Uh, we're talking with Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. We've been talking about the weekly top three. We're going to finish up with number two before we dive into number three. Number two uh, continues our discussions now uh, about what happens with the uh, with the legislature um over the you know i mean what happens with the special session now that the senate is going to be facing uh the question of the uh, uh of the uh, uh of the final bills coming out of the house for the special session uh we talked about how lyman hoffman could become the swing vote i guess my bigger question here and one of the reasons why i was wondering on this brad uh you know i because I, I was asking myself why would the governor not want to fight this whole question of the SBR sweep uh, or the PCE sweep, rather, uh, up to the Supreme Court. Um, I mean, is he holding it in it as you know as an arrow in his quiver? I mean, does, is there a time frame? Is there a time deadline on that where you know Lyman Hoffman he could basically get Lyman in the corner and say, you know, you, you got to play ball, or I'm going to go ahead and I'll 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 take this up to the courts, or is that is that a a, a chess piece that can be used, or is there a time factor limit on it? Where, where are we at? Well, the governor's already said that he's not going to appeal it, uh, and I think. Notices of appeal, if I recall correctly from my lawyer days, notices of appeal of Superior Court decisions have to be filed in 30 days, and I'm and I'm fairly certain we're past the 30-day point, uh, or 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 very close to the 30-day point on uh, on the uh, on the Superior Court's decision on PCE. So, I think the governor's already made the decision that he's taking uh, that appeal uh, off the table. Now, there's been a discussion. There's been some discussion of of the SBR still going up to or the or the sweep issue still going up to the Supreme Court in another way. That is, if the if the PFD ultimately comes out uh, tied to the the SBR, and the governor continues to take the position that the SBR uh, is not uh, is, is, has been swept and that there's no funds in the SBR, um, then uh, there's been discussion. That, that that might be appealed <clears throat> by those who would want to, you know, uh, use the SBR to fund the PFD, uh, a portion of the PFD, and it would, and potentially that would get up to the Supreme Court, and that Supreme Court decision on the SBR potentially might affect PCE uh, as well. But right now, uh, the uh, the way it sits right now, uh, uh, PCE I think is off the table, has been decided, and 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 not subject to sweep. You know, it's interesting because um, 
you know, what are the uh, what are the things that and we're getting really down into the esoterica of this. But I mean, one of the things is that the permanent fund is supposed to be paid out of by statute is supposed to be paid out of the earnings reserve. And yet we've seen all this, you know, kind of shell gaming going on behind the scenes where they're drawing it from multiple different funding sources. Uh, and it's like they're trying to tangle it up in this whole spider's web instead of just paying it out of the earnings reserve, which is where it's supposed to be coming from. Um, you know, I mean, it, you know, the draw goes from the earnings reserve to the general fund anyway. Why not just draw it out as a portion of that? Why, I mean, why do you think all this different gamesmanship in the funding sources from the various accounts and everything instead of just paying it from where it's statutorily supposed to come from? Well, I think there's two reasons. Th this isn't the first year that they've done that. Uh, actually, this may be, they may have done this, they may have done it since, um, for three or four years, but they've done it for, for several years where they've tied it to other funding sources, either the general fund or right. the CBR or, or other funding sources. And I think there's two things. One, uh, and I think it goes back to uh, uh, Bryce, Br Bryce Edgman. One is that they want to make the point that uh, that the S that the the, P, the 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 POMV draw is for the general fund, uh, and it's not to be divided. It's not to be shared with uh, the uh, the 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 PFD. That that it, the POMV draw from the earnings reserve goes into the general fund. It can be it, it'll be appropriated by the by the legislature, however they decide to appropriate it. Uh, and and basically uh, they they're proving the point that they can ignore. Uh, the P ignore the PFD statute uh, in another way. The second, the second reason I think they they're they're tangling it up is it, for, from what Bert did certainly from the conference committee in the out of the regular session uh, or the first special session or whatever it was um, that uh, that they're trying to condition the PFD on uh, to getting the PFD on votes on other things that right. that, that otherwise not might not be uh, uh, approved. Um, and so they, they're, they're tying it to the SBR or they're tying it to the CBR because they've got other their other they're funding other things out of those uh, at various times. And they're, they want to drag people by, by 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 making the PFD conditional on on coming out of those things. They want to drag other people along uh, to vote for uh, those additional uh, things as well. So I, I think it's both optics to, to prove the point that the PFD is no longer. Uh, that they're going to just no longer follow the statute in any way on the PFD and the and the POMV is entire the POMV draw is entirely for the general fund, um, and and secondly then to to play games and and uh, and and try to tie people's hands by conditioning it on uh, on on voting for other things when you vote to open the CBR for example. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. I think that ties up most of number two. Although we do have this this thing that we I've been hearing about this kind of this rumor is that there is some disgruntlement amongst the majority in the Senate that they could potentially try and roll the chair uh, in Senate finance if they don't get their way, or it could fracture the majority in the Senate, which could spell some pretty tough times in there. Any thoughts on that before we move on to number three quickly? It, it certainly could. I mean, the PFD issue has has held that potential uh, throughout uh, the, the the time that the that the this majority has has been together. That the P, that the majority could fracture at any moment. Here's here's the problem, though. If you fracture the majority, uh, what happens? Well, Bert and Natasha and Click go over to go over to, to Begich's side, Tom Begich's side, and form an alignment with the uh, with the Democrats. Uh, Gary Stevens, uh, uh, others uh, do that, and and it's it's never fractured because nobody's quite certain what who who ends up in the majority um, in that situation. So I I think I think there will continue to be threats, continue to be uh, uh, the potential that the majority fractures uh, uh, as a result of this, but it's it's held together by by you know bailing wire and spit and a few other things. Uh, by the concern about, you know, if we do split, what happens? Who gets the majority? Right. Who's going to run Senate finance then? Uh, and uh, and and do we just end up with Bert still being Bert and Natasha still being on Senate finance, just you know, as part of a as a part of a bipartisan majority, as a, as opposed to being uh, part of the uh, of the Republican majority? Right. 
All right, well, let's quickly move on to number three here. we got about three minutes. Um, looks like some good news on Willow has come out now. ConocoPhillips has made their stance clear. Well, it's, it's good news in the context of bad news. I mean, it's it's <laughs> it's it's the bad news is the, the I mean, just to re- revisit for a second that the district court found that the environmental impact statement with respect to uh, with respect to the Willow project was deficient in several respects, sent it back to the agency for for work, which uh, puts uh, which puts Willow up in the air. The The question was, does does, does Conoco have the patience? Does Conoco have patient capital? Uh, to ride through another wave of regulatory review and then potentially another wave of court review behind that uh, will they will they continue to 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 remain with the commitment to fund uh, fund willow uh, uh, long term sometimes when you get uh, rejections like this uh, the uh, the capital goes elsewhere the capital right. goes to other projects uh, elsewhere in the world but Conoco, the good news is that Conoco has said they, they they are going to be patient. They are going to work with the agency. They continue to believe in Willow. They continue to want the Willow project uh, to go forward. They're going to continue work on the Willow project uh, to uh, to do it, uh, to, to get it put back together again, to get Humpty Dumpty put back together again. But they did make the point, as, as they have made before, that they're not going to go to FID, final investment decision, which is when you commit the money. They're not going to go to FID until all of the legal issues are resolved. So we're going to wait. That means we're going to wait on. Uh, they they did not say they were going to appeal. They still have the right to appeal, but they did not say they were going to appeal. Uh, so that means if we go down this track, the agency reviews uh, the Willow Project again. The Biden administration reviews the Willow Project again, probably imposes more conditions on it as a result of that. Conoco assesses whether it's going to accept those conditions. Um, and then we potentially have a court review uh, beyond that again. So Willow certainly is delayed, but but the fact that Conoco is sticking with it, I think, is uh, is not unexpected, but is good news nonetheless. Because you know they they certainly don't have to. They could certainly go go another direction. This adds another two to three years to the cycle, right? I mean, if if you know all things being you know, good and, and well and equal 24 to 36 months again to kind of add it to this process from start to finish. Yeah. And, and as you will recall, when we discussed Willow before, part of the environmental uh, community's goal here is to stretch it out to the point that Conoco loses patients, right. uh, either as a result of the additional conditions that may be imposed by the Biden administration uh, as a result of the additional environmental review uh, or the passage of time, uh, you know, to seeing what's happening with global warming, seeing what's happening with the, with the, with the withdrawal of, of funding for projects in the in the face of global warming, um, and the concern about the the long term nature of the oil industry, uh, potentially, you know, Conoco losing patience because of that and going to uh, shorter cycle projects down in the lower 48 or elsewhere in the world. So, it it raises the risk. It certainly increases the risk. That Willow ultimately doesn't go forward, but but it is good news that Conoco is, is saying that they're going to have the patience to uh, to stick with it uh, at least for now, uh, and uh, and see the process on through. Yeah, no, I mean it'll definitely uh, that. I, mean, I think it's good news because again, it gives it, this is all a uh, this all goes back to kind of the optics of it. I mean, it, it just shows that Conoco is more committed to it. And uh, and I think it uh, it helps solidify uh, I think it helps solidify development and, and exploration in Alaska in the future to see that one of the bigger uh, corporation now granted they're making a lot of money which is great but um, but it, it just to see that they are they are continuing that investment cycle and it, it will help attract hopefully others in the future. Yeah, I will add one one other thing factor to this. I, I think I think to some degree this also depends on the reelection of Lisa Murkowski. Um, the Biden administration has been over backwards for Willow. Uh, if you'll recall, we discussed this on in previous episodes. Uh, uh, the Biden administration has, in fact, supported Willow, supported Willow in the district court, and has been over backwards to continue to to try to continue to make Willow viable. Um, in not insignificant part because of Lisa Murkowski's critical role in the Senate. Um, if Lisa Murkowski got replaced with someone who was never going to vote for the Biden administration. 
I'm not sure the Biden administration would would bend over as far backwards uh, to uh, to 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 make uh, this a, a, a an achievable uh, project. So there's a lot of things sitting between now and FID uh, at the or final investment decision at the at the at the at the end of all this. Uh, but there's a lot of factors at play. But I think one of them also is uh, is uh, Lisa Murkowski's status. <laughs> way to way to tie all that up into that. Oof, man, that's all we need. All right. Well, uh, I mean, I guess that's uh, that's politics, baby. That's how it works, it, right? It is politics, and and people will say, "Oh no, that shouldn't have any influence on how the administration, you know, does its environmental review." Well, th- those people haven't been around the block as many times <laughs> with uh, with these things as as maybe I have. Um, it 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 can't help but have an influence. Uh, and and again, a lot of people, you know, credited uh, Lisa's critical position in the Senate to the Biden administration backing up a uh, willow before the court before. So right. we'll we'll see. A lot a lot of things a lot of things up in the air. But Conoco's statement that they have patient capital uh, is a is a key step. Without that, none of the rest would matter. So it's it's a key step. All right, Brad Keithley, enjoy yourself, my friend. Thanks for coming on board and joining us today. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week in the Weekly Top 3.